All right. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Welcome. Welcome to the MVP panel, SharePoint Online, on-premise, and everything in between. Everything. <laughs> everything. Uh, my name is Dan Holm. I'm the co-founder of IT Unity, and let's really quick just introduce ourselves, and then we'll do the first round. I'm Christian Buckley. I am a uh, Office 365 MVP, and I am the Managing Director of Americas for GT Consult, based out in Bellevue. I'm Laura Rogers. I'm a SharePoint MVP, and I am a Manager of SharePoint Consultants at Rackspace Hosting. Um, I'm Jennifer Mason. I'm from Rackspace Hosting. I'm a senior technologist um, who's working on our Office 365 practice. And I'm Chris McNulty. I'm a SharePoint MVP. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Cryptone, an ISV based outside of the proud city of Boston, Massachusetts. All right. Thanks. And you are Microsoft Ignite 2015. Yay! <laughs> right on. And let's all say hi to the people downstairs in the overflow room. Hi, people downstairs. Hello. They can only hear us. They can't see us. You don't have to sit up like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. I know. <laughs> It was just for dramatic effect. So uh, we do have people downstairs, and uh, so that we include them, I'm going to suggest that if you're listening to this stream downstairs, you are going to be able to submit questions as well. You will just uh, tweet to me. Uh, so my name is split on the slide here. It's Dan Holm, and my Twitter, hash, my Twitter at tag is Dan Holm, all one word. So if you're downstairs, when we get to the Q&A portion, feel free to tweet to me, and I will inject those questions into the flow. But we thought we would start off by sharing some of our experiences over the last couple of years with our own companies and with our customers, going from on-prem and taking that journey into the cloud, sort of setting the stage, and then opening up the floor to questions, which I assume there are a few of. So which direction should we start from? Christian, why don't we start with you? Sure. So uh, for those that uh, don't follow me, so my, on Twitter, I'm Buckley Planet. I do, uh, I write the occasional article. Uh, I talk, don't mock me, please. Uh, I, I talk a lot about the transition to hybrid. Hybrid is not something that's new. It's been around for a long time. Uh, I was just talking in my last session about how I, I went to work for a company back in 2001 where we were developing a hosted collaboration platform on a competing technology for a different vendor, uh, but back in 2001. And we ran into these issues where companies were saying, we want to be able to integrate with this and use this, but we want it to be, uh, we want to remain on-prem with these other systems. And so we went in some very complex integrations. But it's something that has been out there, been and talked about, and it's exciting to see so much of that the conversation come to the forefront, but it's not new. I'm just glad that from the Microsoft ecosystem that Microsoft is recognizing and embracing a lot of that language, which I think is catching up to where a lot of the community has been the last few years. All right, so I'm Laura Rogers. My perspective is that I, I come from being an IT pro. So, and I, as IT pros, we have this sort of, we like having the, the total control of our data centers and the total control of, of what the content is. And it's, it's been interesting watching this sort of struggle over the past couple of years for all, all these people that are used to having that. And then this whole concept of going to the cloud is, it's been a little scary, but Microsoft, it's been interesting how much they've been focusing on security, especially, you know, in the keynote, they talked about all the different uh, measures that they're taking. So they're, it, they're making, they're, they're going overboard to really make sure that you all understand that they are going to take care of your data. So I think that that's actually gotten a lot more comforting to people, um, even, you know, more and more so that, that people don't have to feel like they're losing out or they're losing control or, or they have to worry about um, someone getting to their data. Um, I started hybrid as well about 15, 16 years ago now. I put my first server in a data center that wasn't my own in 1999, actually, uh, and have worked with customers that are both completely in the cloud, as well as customers who aren't even connected to any network outside their building. They're black box networks that you can't bring anything into or out of. So I've seen every, the whole spectrum of, of business requirements, and I think what's most interesting and most important for us all are a couple of phrases that I kind of use as, as catchphrases and disruptive comments, which is first, that at SharePoint Office 365 don't matter. What matters is delivering business value while optimizing risk. And it's not about minimizing risk, and it's not about maximizing value, it's about optimizing both. Um, and being thoughtful and careful about what you're doing where and why, and aligning each individual workload or use case in your business 
with whatever technology happens to deliver it best. So I'm a big believer, and the other thing I say quite regularly is that information technology is dead. I believe that IT now is about innovation technology. And one of the Microsoft blogs from one of the execs this week called it uh, innovation transformation. Um, regardless of how you think about it, IT has changed. I know Christian just finished a session on that. Um, and I think that it's time that we all celebrate the fact that we're now not about doing everything that IT pros have done in the past. And we're able to actually play with a much bigger toolbox and deliver a significantly more interesting set of capabilities to our business. Yeah, it's been interesting over the last couple of years. I spent a lot of time working with organizations on productivity tools. And a lot of times I'm helping the non-developers work on building tools. And they are really looking at Office 365 and, and going to the Microsoft Cloud in terms of functionality. And it's matched then with cost-saving efforts. So we can save so much money and we can do these different things. And it's a dilemma of, but how do we actually get there? And so you can combine it with all of the other pieces, like Laura said, security and different pieces like that. But it's just been interesting to watch the transition of, of people looking at the tools that are available to them and wanting to say, you know, I can go do this quicker and faster using this tool, or I can go about doing this, and there's new functionality available to me that will make me more efficient, and it's coming out at a rate that's so fast. And so from a feature perspective over um, just even in the last, you know, three to six months, I've seen a lot of people become more and more interested in what's available to them just so that they can be more productive, more efficient in a very quick time frame. Kind of hard to add more to what everyone has already said, but I'll try. Um, in the last few years, I've seen some organizations struggle with the best way to conceptualize hybrid. And thinking about some of them will randomly move some departments to the cloud and keep other departments on premises without actually matching those departmental or divisional needs to the true capabilities of the workloads they're moving. And uh, an organizational structure where randomly half of the department document libraries are in the cloud and half are on-premises is really hard to navigate. Um, it, <clears throat> my company published a survey just this week on our blog at insights.cryptzone.com. And we surveyed hundreds of enterprises about their Office 365 adoption. And some of our questions were around hybrid. And one of the interesting things we asked is for organizations that are currently in a hybrid posture, how long do you plan to stay there? Because historically, many people regard hybrid as a transitional state, where I'm not all the way up into the cloud yet, but I'm going to run this way for a year, two years, three years. And the vast majority of organizations said that they plan to stay in a hybrid um, model in perpetuity. That you know, people sometimes talk about hybrid as if it's just a either or, either my information delivery services are going to be serviced from on-prem, or they're going to come from the cloud. And the truth is, I think that the best way to think of where we are is what some term the multi-cloud where one cloud, quote unquote, is actually on-premises. The other cloud may be an Office 365 cloud. There are other services that are coming from other providers, some of which are Microsoft-based, like Azure, or the people who are using services like Salesforce.com. Um, and it's our role, you know, I come from an IT pro background, um, to in some ways act as concierge and integrator of the best of breed services and making sure that we're matching business demands to our ability to service and deliver those things. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, for those people down in the room downstairs, I'm getting tweets that it's very cold down there. Just squish down, squish together a little more closely and keep each other warm. Jumpy jacks. <laughs> exactly. All right, so uh, you've heard some of our perspectives and I, uh, and I hope they were provided a good valuable foundation for us. Um, let's now dive into questions. And we'll start with one from downstairs and then we'll start passing some mics around here. Uh, in SharePoint 2016, uh, they're introducing the Cloud Hybrid Picker, or at least that's currently the name of the tool, that allows you to deploy hybrid work Loads, uh, with a wizard-like experience. Um, and someone from downstairs asked for some more dis description of that tool and how it's used. Does someone want to take that? Okay, I can if we need to, but yeah. Okay, I was in the workshop on Sunday and uh, the goal is really to reduce the number of steps it takes to configure those hybrid workloads, including search, um, and um, um, and OneDrive and such. Um, and so the experience is that you will go to a, a part of central administration, that that will uh, open up a cloud configuration capability. It will give you, and the wizard, the UI right now is non-existent. It looks like an HTML page, um, uh, like, a, like circa 2000. Um, but that's the way they do it. They build the business logic, then they build the UI. Um, but you pick your workload, and then it, then it starts downloading the bits you need automatically from the web. So this, it's a service wizard. 
that you're actually launching something from Azure that downloads the bits into your farm, installs them as an MSI, MSP, whatever it is you need, um, and uh, in injects all the things you need into your environment. So really, there shouldn't be any more steps besides that. What that also gives Microsoft the ability to do is minimize the footprint of the cloud integration to exactly what you need. So rather than baking into your, your initial installation all the bits for all the potential things you might do in the cloud, it allows you to get just the pieces you need, which is, which is very nice. The other thing I'd say to think about is if you've looked at what the Azure team has been doing, kind of in the evolution of DirSync through Wadic into AD Connect, there's an increasing focus on recognizing that getting ADFS set up, especially for bi-directional sync and what's involved in OAuth, can be overly ornate and complex for many organizations. And so they've increasingly been advancing that. And part of what I anticipate that will be in the final product is also some of the learnings out of that initiative, which I encourage you to take advantage of if you haven't already, coming into not just the authentication but also the information services. Yep, and I also would say, oh sorry, I'll say one other thing, which is another feature of this approach is that it allows Microsoft to introduce new cloud integration options because it's all in the cloud. So if they suddenly introduce an additional uh, hybrid capability, it, they'll just put it into the application. It's all done with manifests and bits up in the cloud. You'll see it in the wizard. You'll be able to click it, and they're not going to have to release patches just to push new features into your environment to further power your on-prem environment with cloud services. I was just going to add, just as from an administrator experience, I mean, so much of the focus is, we've seen this, I think response from uh, admins that are going in and custom to getting their hands on all of the detail and the logs and all of the things that they're uh, you know, on-prem, you have these streamlined experiences. Uh, so they are thinking of it both on the back end streamlining and, and minimizing the footprint, <clears throat> but also streamlining the experience on the front end. And so it doesn't mean that you're necessarily losing the power of the, the, what the capability is actually doing, uh, but it is, it's just it's a much different experience. Part of the adjustment with moving to some of these cloud services then of course is understanding here's what I do today and here's how it works in the new environment and making sure that if you have other customizations that are built, reports that you're responsible for, part of your auditing compliance requirements for your organizations, that you understand how they work in the new world and in, in the cloud. And uh, just Microsoft is trying as hard as they can to make sure, make sure this is all very seamless to the end user. So we get all these great new functionalities on the back end to be able to integrate search, integrate user profiles, and the end user just knows that they're typing a search term and seeing results or looking at their profile. They don't have to worry about a cloud one versus an on-premises one in all these different places. It's just one experience to them. So that's something that they've really been focusing on. I'll just say ditto so we can go to the next question. Uh -huh. All right, let's take one from this one. We've got a hand up right away in the middle. Uh, so let's get, let's get a mic uh, driven right in there. Uh, okay. In your experience, how are you progressing those people who rely heavily on SSRS? Okay, so to repeat the question for the recording in the stream, um, in our opinion, how are, people, what, what, how are people dealing with SSRS? All right. So, um, fantastic question. One of the things to be mindful of is that you know, increasingly, um, the business intelligence stack is one that you can look to be driven out of the SQL team increasingly coming forward. Um, and speaking as someone who I think has written 600 or 700 SSRS reports over the course of my career, um, it, it's a great tool. It's an integrated workload for on-premises. Um, what I can tell you is that the Power BI team is very aware that reporting, quote unquote, is a workload not yet fully delivered and enabled through Power BI and that they're well aware of it. Um, but it is one of the strongest cases moving forward in any kind of hybrid methodology. If you are looking for reporting, that is a fantastic on-premises workload. Um, and it's well suited, you know, what the investments that people have made, it's a very mature technology. It goes back to the year 2000, you know, in the year 2000, remember that show? Um, dating myself a little bit. In the year 2000. I knew he would sing something. Um, and it's, it, it is an opportunity to consider what you have been using reporting services for in your environment. Reporting services, some of its native functionality is anticipated into the Power BI tool set. And so it's time for a rethink of what's the information that I'm delivering in the report. Is it better service through Power BI or not?
And I think one of the things that we have to all recognize here is that we come to a conference like this, there's a ton of great hype about all of the new features and all of the new things that are coming, but we're still very much in transition periods. So there are certain things that if you're doing them on-prem and that they work and there is no solution in the cloud for what you're trying to do, that means you, it, it, that's the perfect time to say this is where I'm staying and this is what I'm doing but you want to stay connected to what's coming. And the reason I say you want to stay connected to what's coming is because Microsoft, unlike things that I've seen in the past and when I first started, they're listening very much right now. In the Yammer groups, at conferences like this, it is not hard to find the people that are making those decisions and doing those things. So if there is a workload that you're working on and it makes sense to keep it on-prem, by all means, there's a lot of workloads like right, that right now that we have to just look at. And that's, Dan was kind of saying before, it's not necessarily about this or that, it's about what workloads make sense to go in different places, but then to identify what's the future of that workload and where they're going and how can I get in to get my voice out there so that they understand how am I truly using the tools so that the end product actually makes sense. So I think in the transition period, what we need to do is we need to identify you know, what's gonna make it so that I can go, and if I can't go, how do I continue to do it on-prem, but how do I now get engaged in the conversations so that I'm, I know what's happening, I know what's coming out, I know what's on the roadmaps, and I'm kind of giving my feedback along the way of where we're going. But it's just a transition period that we kind of have to accept. Yes, I absolutely love SSRS. It's one of my favorite things in SharePoint, but I, I still I take a step back and say, I'm gonna start learning you know, Power Pivot and learning Power View and just start thinking at least about the reports that you're doing and how maybe they could be translated to start doing them in, in some of these other ways. Just as a backup plan, you know, just kind of start getting familiar with all these just in case. Yeah, so we have a, so just the pragmatic standpoint, I, and Dan, to your, to your point, is, is that, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, understand, understanding the, the, the trade-offs, the risks around that, uh, you know, but it is, <clears throat> from a pragmatic project management standpoint, you approach these, it's fundamentally about what the business needs and supporting the business, not about the technology. And so you need to run your business, SSRS maybe exactly where you need to stay for the time being. And we have a customer who had this exact scenario, and we said that what we, where we landed was we're going to experiment uh, with the Power BI, and we're just gonna start exploring that. But the plan of record, what we're moving forward on is to remain that piece on-prem. So that's, that's what we did for this customer because it made sense based on what they've been built out, what's working, and what runs their business. We didn't want to disrupt that. All right, and we had a question right, right here. Actually, I, I wanted to just, Go one on. other note on that. If you need SSRS in the cloud, you do have options for doing that. You know, the, you were not constrained to on-premises versus Office 365. That's a workload that you could host in Azure, or you could move to the rack spaces and other providers of the world and be able to run SSRS from a cloud, but using the more the traditional on-premises modality there. My question is really for Dan, but I'd welcome all opinions here. When you did your NBC Olympic installations, did you do Office 365 or a hybrid, and were there any big lessons learned or gotchas from those? That was an awesome question. So, um, uh, and it's a case study of sort of the idea of making sure you're doing things for the right reasons. In, in the preparations for the last games, which was Sochi, um, we, had, we had a real opportunity to think about the cloud, um, but it wasn't right for us. And it wasn't because the cloud wasn't suited, it was that our network connectivity uh, was a potential bottleneck. We had a very expensive, very limited, limited pipes to the internet from Sochi. Um, everything um, uh, was dependent on our internal workloads in SharePoint, and so we didn't want to take a risk of that going down. Uh, we also were told going into Sochi that everything that went over the network would be sniffed. There was no doubt about that. We were told very clearly, just be aware. Um, and so we decided not to. We did some experimentation, though, while we were there, of what we will be doing moving forward. And I would, I would, we don't, we're building for Rio right now. I believe we are probably going to put some of our um, universal workloads in Office 365, so probably our intranet homepage, uh, and some of the things that we need people to be able to get to from wireless devices and from outside our firewall. Because inside of our network, our production network, we only allow wired devices for a variety of reasons. So we're gonna put some things in the cloud, some things on-prem, and the internet homepage will very likely be in both places, so that regardless of whether you're inside the firewall or outside the firewall, you'll get the same navigation experience, and then what you go to will be in one place or the other. Um, anyone have any other uh, thoughts on sort of the- I didn't watch much of the Olympics, so. <laughs> 
Who won? <laughs> Who won? All right. Let's uh, let's take a question uh, from uh, from Twitter here. Um, uh, there's a couple of very specific workload questions, and so these will be pretty fast ones, and we'll just sort of uh, tackle these. Uh, the first is, what is the future of publishing? Will uh, Delve, microsites, uh, next gen portals, groups, etc., take over for publishing? Who wants to take that? Uh, sure thing. I mean, one of Microsoft's philosophies moving forward in 2016 is about, in some ways, it's about cleaning up some of the functions that are getting less use and doubling down on what the core workloads of SharePoint are that we all love and care about. And those things tend to be files and sites and portals and content management. And Microsoft is using the term content management um, in many regards to refer to enterprise content management. And in some regards, regarding publishing and web, I'll call it web style content management. SharePoint is not primarily being positioned as the tool to build promiscuous, um, anonymous, public-facing websites. However, the same ideas of how we publish web pages is very much a part of that and a, a core part of Microsoft's investments moving forward, absolutely. I think we have to look at the new technologies that are coming out, Delve, Sway. If you look at the new authoring authoring tool that's part of the new blogs that just came out, I think what we're seeing is that they're instead of taking what we've always done because we've always done it and changing features on it, they seem to be innovating new ways to do things that really match that mobile first, cloud first. I bet you guys are sick of hearing that, but mobile first, cloud first, and, and we're looking at these new technologies, and as these things start to merge and meld together, I think we're gonna start to see some of the core functionalities of tools that we're used to using, their whole concept is gonna change. So the idea of still being able to publish content inside of SharePoint and Office 365 and using Azure is gonna work, but because of the way that they're structured now, we're gonna be able to take the best of all worlds and pull it together into a better experience. So I think it's again that transition as to what's coming. I was just going to say, there's a couple slides that were in the Seth Patton, uh, Bill Bear session on Monday. I don't remember. Days, all these days all blur together. I don't know. Um, that session where they made some of those those kinds of comments that how they're focusing on those where they're making those investments. I think it really makes that case that we're you know we're we're invested in supporting those core workloads. Um, and yeah, the, I think in adding on, take what's good, add on to it. Awesome. I mean, I do think we all would agree that sort of SharePoint as a public-facing website, not a lot of investment. I said, take what's that. good, add on to it. <laughs> exactly. So hopefully that answers some questions there. Another uh, use case, uh, the real quick one, is user profile. With user profile is, uh, in 2016 not relying on FEM anymore, briefly, how does that work? Sure. Um, personally, I think what's going on there is a recognition that um, if you're looking for complex orchestration of identity and two-way synchronization between an Active Directory or any other identity providers and your UPS, trying to do that all within the constraints of a crippled version of Forefront is not going to give you the best enterprise experience. Microsoft is saying, realistically, we know that 80, 90 percent of the organizations who are doing some level of AD integration with UPS, it's a one-way sync. You just need to scrape information out of AD and bring it into UPS. And that's really what they're admitting is what you need. If you need something more complex, absolutely, you can do it with Forefront or something else that can inject into UPS. But trying to get all that power in this little itty bitty constrained box called Forefront, you know, the crippled version of Forefront probably didn't make sense. All right. Uh, let's take a question from the room. We got one in the, in the middle back here. Do we have two? Do we still have a mic runner? Oh, actually, you've got a mic. Great. Hi, um, my question is about forms. We're currently running 2013 on-prem, and we're heavy InfoPath users. We have a lot of browser-based forms, so I want to know Hi. what's happening. <laughs> we took bets okay. at the beginning as to how long it was going to take before the forms question got asked. I'm wanting to it. ask, it's Thursday. She get it I'm running Does out she of get time. paid too? Or? We love it. We love it. We're we're going to let the queen of forms go first. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just the princess. You're the queen. Uh, as, as far as we know right now, um, Microsoft is saying to continue to use InfoPath. There's not an official replacement. Um, I, what I have been personally doing with projects I'm on and, um, and customers that we have on, with these types of requests is 
trying to stick to definitely more simple forms. Definitely don't go the code route because that is 99% not going to be able to be integrated into anything else. Um, but I've been trying to go more the SharePoint lists route. Even you know if you customize the list with InfoPath, at least you still have the data in the list, no matter if InfoPath goes away. And then um, I've also been doing a lot with uh, even just avoiding InfoPath and using just the method of using content types and having multiple content types with different different required fields in just a very simple form in a lot of cases. So um, I, I, my advice is to go the SharePoint list route. There there are a lot of vendors out there, so there are vendors that have you know created ways to do migrations, but there is not an official Microsoft, this is gonna be what the new thing is to replace forms. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Part, and part of their answer is that is exactly that, that the ecosystem has a lot of solutions for that. Um, not that they're not trying to solve that, and they've, got a, they've received a lot of feedback, um, but there are many options that are out there. Um, I, do, I do a show called SharePoint Power Hour every Wednesday at 11, and we, I actually did a series of four or five different Power Hours demoing different other forms, third-party forms products, and just kind of going through it as if what an end user would think and how to, how to use it and just kind of looking at what it would take to use those. Yeah, and where can, where can they get those? Um, YouTube.com slash SharePoint RAX. It's our, uh, that's our yeah. Rackspace channel. I was going to say, there's. Um, I look at the complexity of the forms. So a lot of the forms that we can do in the, the business, they may last um, for six months. They may last for a year. And sometimes I just don't care if I lose the form. So the front end of the form, I just need something to work quickly. Cases like that, I will use InfoPath. If I'm going out right now, if you were to come to me and say, hey, help me build this HR onboarding system that is going to do everything that we need to do, and it's going to be awesome, and it's going to transform the way HR works together and change the company, I wouldn't go near it with InfoPath. I would immediately start looking at either a third-party tool or I would get a developer engaged very early. But if I'm customizing a front-end portal for the United Way campaign, I'm going to customize it in InfoPath and not really care too much at this point. So I think there's pros and cons of each of it, but if I'm building a solution that is going to last for several years, I know that there should be a solution for InfoPath beyond that. So I'm going to look at doing a custom development or look at a vendor. If I do go the route of getting a vendor, I'm probably going to then just start using that vendor for everything because I have that vendor. But if I don't, I'm going to, you know, quickly go and customize things and do things. So it's going to be supported. It's going to stay. It's going to come out in 2016. And we, they know so much that we want answers. We hound them nonstop. Specifically, so, yep. this group yes. hounds yes. them nonstop. Yes, we, we, are, um, we are on their backs. Yes. I, Just at lunch the other day, in <laughs> fact. Yes. Um, so I think it's coming. And we dislike it probably about as much as you guys do. So I wish I could all give you guys a hug and say I'm sorry, but there's no awesome answer yet. I, I will say there's, there's also a half answer and a future answer I want to toss onto the table. So the half answer, which is not nearly as full powered as some of the things people were doing in InfoPath was, is to look at access apps, which if you, what you need to do is stand up a quick and dirty form to capture data with some level of customization access apps. May Take solve what's good. Take what's, I said, take what's good, build on to it. <laughs> but it, short time. Probably I love the access app ones because you can't do workflows and you can't do permissions. So take a poll. How many people have a business process that requires no permissions and no workflows? Yeah. All right. So we've got one, one right just here. A okay. Access just services saying, for just you. Just saying. Yes. The other... Um, the other thing to, I'd encourage you to take a look at is Microsoft's Power Apps initiative. You know, mobile first, cloud first world. You now have more ability to bring things in that may be coming from other teams at Microsoft, including the Azure team. And Power Apps in particular, if you've looked at Microsoft's Project Sienna, is really focused at how do I bring data into a web experience or into a mobile experience that may be coming from sources that are housed in SharePoint or housed in SQL or housed in Azure, and being able to, to do that. Again, it's about matching the workload. Um, that's being requested to the technology that's available to support it. So, so yeah, don't forget Word. Someone, someone, please escort that man out of the room. <laughs> you, you want to sign up for the Notepad conference this fall? <laughs> Notepad, C O N F dot com. <laughs> it's the textiest so, conference ever. So, to put a quick button on it, InfoPath is going to be around for a while, as from a support perspective. So, don't panic about things you've already built. 
Don't probably think about using InfoPath for heavyweight code base things, probably a bad idea. The InfoPath for lightweight stuff, list customization, probably pretty good. Some other options, access apps, um, um, third party tools, uh, and third party tools also empower a lot of other things. And one other thing that wasn't mentioned is the app model. Um, these days, if, if for a developer to write a simple form that pumps data into a list is actually pretty darned easy. So um, if you've got the development resources, take a look at that as well. Um, is it a related question to forms? Is it a follow up or a new question? Uh, well, SharePoint, uh, customizing forms with SharePoint Designer is kind of uh, probably not something you'd want to do moving forward. Um, we're talking about using InfoPath where you've got two ways of creating an InfoPath form in SharePoint. One is the forms library, which is sort of an XML-based thing that's fairly complex. And, and again, if you have InfoPath forms-based solutions, probably they're fine for a while, but I wouldn't necessarily invest a lot in new ones moving forward. The other thing that Laura was mentioning is you can actually go to a list and say, customize this list in, in InfoPath. It's, an, it's a purple button in the list. That's what I was referring to, the InfoPath. Yeah, and, it, this form. and it's a lightweight. It, you're literally just changing. The, the way SharePoint do, does its form by, by default. So you can add colors, you can add highlighting, you can do some, some pretty useful stuff to make it beautiful and nice to interact with. I, um, but, but what you can't have is a bunch of code and logic built into it. I will say my own bias, you know, I, I, was, I, I ran consulting for years before jumping into the ISV world five years ago. I absolutely love SharePoint Destroyer, I mean SharePoint Designer. <laughs> because it's a, it's a, in many cases, it winds up becoming a jobs program for consultants. <laughs> That's very true. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. We have another question. We have a mic already positioned here. Yep, thank you. Uh, how many in here work at companies who are on-premise only? How many work here at companies which will stay on-premise for the next few couple of years? Okay, so that's the baseline. <laughs> Looking back, back a few years, you could sense that Microsoft was talking about cloud only. They wanted everyone to go to the cloud, obviously. Uh, like you say, now you can see that Microsoft kind of listened to their customers, and this week we can hear a lot of a hybrid. That's good, of course. What is your take on the roadmap for uh, the one that are on-premises customers? I, I think that starting off, when you look at 2016, a lot of the changes that they're bringing to 2016 are things that they have learned from doing Office 365. And so I think that they understand that a huge percentage of their customer base is still going to be on-prem for a long time. But the rate that innovation is happening and the way that they can do it quickly is through Office 365. So I think you're going to see Office 365 is still going to get a lot of features. There's still going to be features that at this point cannot work on-prem. And it's just because of the way that the features are. Is that going to be a forever thing? Probably not. Technologies are going to continue changing. And then uh, SharePoint on-prem is going to continue to be updated. But it's just the way that Microsoft has switched their innovation cycles, which a lot of amazing things are coming out of it. And then it's going to continue to come on-prem in cycles that are there. I think we'll also see the rate of the cycles will be determined by customers. So I know in the beginning when they first said, yes, there'll be a next version of SharePoint, they actually did a lot of research with their customers to say, how quickly should this come? And the results that they got out of it was it should go with the regular cycle of the three years, and that's about what they're keeping to. So I think if customer needs changes, that will change as well. We'll see the innovation come first with Office 365 and make its way back to on-prem. But I think the shiny things that get bows you know, get a lot of attention here. And I think it's important that even if you're fully dedicated on-prem, you should be paying attention to what's coming in Office 365. You should be up to speed on it. You should be learning about it so that your voice can get included in what comes down and what doesn't. So you should still be engaged. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, if the message that's been landed at SharePoint conferences before around SharePoint 2013 is about how do we bring you to the cloud? The 2016 message and moving forward is about how do we bring the cloud to you. In talking to folks in the product group, one of the things that comes clear is Microsoft learned an awful lot more in the very first month of running Office 365 about how SharePoint truly behaves than in their first 10 years of selling the product. Amen. And a lot of the enhancements that, that you can see 
if you, if you went to Bill's session yesterday, um, Bill Bear's session, it was at 9 o'clock yesterday. If you didn't go there, I'd encourage you to download the deck and see the video. Um, is about taking some of that learning and some of the telemetry that they're able to get for Office 365. What they know are the architectural tweaks that make SharePoint scale much better in the cloud. How do we bring that learning down to an on-premises environment so that on-premises is an equal participant in the information architecture? And it's perfectly fine to be just on premises. So, and, and and it's really comforting to see that Microsoft has realized that and is encouraging that. It, it they're not going to do something to you. and They're not going to yank it away. Then they've really made a lot of improvements to that server side, to just the core, like behind the scenes, what's going on. I mean, even if the front end didn't change one bit, the what the use, end users see, I I feel comfort in the fact that they've spent so much time and energy and worked very hard on fixing the server part and making it more robust and making and really doing all those tweaks and I take comfort in that and knowing that they they care and they're showing that they care about on-premises by all that work that they've done. I think a lot of the a lot of people had fear because of the what was said what was not said uh, with the 2013 release and there was just the community went wild with you know trying to read between the lines lines that didn't exist in many cases uh, and so I think that they're they're realizing some of the failures in the messaging around that and they're really trying to make that known just to your point is that that if you're on on-prem and no plans to move the cloud that is okay what's what is great in the message that came out on Monday as well is the fact that this is the first version with 2016 of SharePoint that was driven through the online first. So SharePoint on-prem developed based on what was built for cloud first. Uh, and, and so that's the model going forward. If you want the latest, greatest, the, the fastest innovation, it's going to be coming from uh, online. But as long as businesses uh, will, are depending on SharePoint on-prem and buying it, it will continue to be there. And there is, there will be another version and another version on-prem as long as people are buying it. So it, it is... Uh, for those of us, uh, uh, and again, there's another article that was out. I mentioned it this morning in my session, CMS Wire. It came out Monday or Tuesday, quoting Seth, talking about the, like the, the, the global 2000, like 80% of those companies still have on-prem SharePoint. They're going to continue. They're not going to walk away from the primary revenue of what's driving all of this, um, but it just doesn't make business sense, so they'll continue to support that. Yeah, and I'll, I'm going to wrap up with a couple comments on the same question. Um, first of all, I mentioned earlier it's all about optimizing value and risk and putting things in the right place. Um, so you need to, to Jennifer's point, stay in touch with what's going on in the cloud because there are going to be workloads and use cases that you've got that need to go into the cloud in order to optimize value and minimize risk. It's no longer a one side or the other. Again, I, there are a few extremes. There are black box networks I've worked in. That's an extreme. But I've also worked in three-letter intelligence agencies that started my engagement with them saying there's no way we're moving to the cloud and by the time we were done, we were in the cloud. Once they really did the full risk and value equation and really understood the security picture, for example, um, they started seeing that. I also was with a customer who literally, one month I was with them, they're like, no way are we ever moving to Microsoft's cloud. Two weeks later, Microsoft announced 50 gig inboxes in exchange. Two weeks later, they signed the licensing agreement. <laughs> there comes a point where costs get so obvious that it becomes a no-brainer and something tips the business whether it's a use case or an economic equation, and you don't want to be the one who, when the business tips, are sitting there going, oh, well, I have not even thought about it. I don't know how to integrate my identities. It's going to take me six or nine months. You don't want to be that person who's preventing the business from moving forward. And, and, and again, all of this is with the foundation. I totally get there's reasons to stay on-prem for certain workloads. Now, there's a couple more points I'll make to sort of wrap this up, which is a uh, good survey about how many of you are on-prem are on only. I'd like to ask, how many of you, if you walked around your business and really looked at what your users are running on a day-to-day -day basis, would see them using cloud-based services, consumer-grade in many cases, that aren't in the control of IT? Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 OneDrive, sharing with Dropbox. Box, yeah. Okay, you are hybrid. Welcome. <laughs> the question is, are you in control of your hybrid infrastructure, right? Um, and uh, so think about it that way. And one of the more interesting things, this is my last point, one of the more interesting things I've seen in the last two years is the equation, the, the discussion has changed. Two years ago, what I heard people saying is, oh, should we stay on-prem with SharePoint or should we go to Dropbox or Google or name the third-party tool? Because they were looking at, should we just move this stuff off of SharePoint and go to these places that in the cloud were innovating really quickly? 
Now the discussion is which Microsoft stack should we use and how should we use it? That's a very interesting uh, change that Microsoft should actually be very proud of the fact that they've shifted the discussion. All right, so we've got a lot of additional questions. Let's- uh, Thank you for the answers. Yeah, sure. I've got one very fast question, which is I don't want to out any Microsoft product managers who may be in the room. Huh. I just want to hear if they will get to hear what people are sharing if this is being recorded and there's a plan to share yeah, it with them. It's, it's being recorded and also the Office 365 tech Yammer network, um, they're always in there. So you can go in there and post your questions. Like, even if you're on-prem, they're always in there listening to that. Um, quite often I've posted questions and someone I have never even met is on the product team will shoot me a private message and say, let's talk more about it. Yeah, unfortunately the five of us are fairly shy and we never share our opinions with Microsoft. <laughs> Um, but the most important thing, and I've, I've said this many, many times, it's not just the fact that we're MVPs that gives us an on-ramp to Microsoft, which doesn't hurt, but um, UserVoice.com and all of the forums for that, um, I can tell you that the Microsoft product groups look at that religiously, and they really look at what you put in, what you vote for, what are the features you care about, and it's not strictly numerical. Just because something has a thousand votes doesn't mean it's the next thing that they work on. Sometimes the next thing they work on is something with three, but they really pay attention to user voice and I encourage you to use And they that do tool. a great job at driving the right person within the team over to those conversations. I mean, that happens a lot where there, there'll be a thread and you'll see that, especially in, uh, out on Yammer in the 365 network, where they will say, you know, I'm not the right person, it's such and such, let's go. And, and there'll be that interaction and then an hour later or a day later, whatever the time, the, you'll see the person pop on, try and answer that, take it offline. They're very responsive. So yeah, the Yammer network for discussions and questions and sort of staying on top of things and the user voice for submitting your feedback. And interestingly, some if you go to the user voice, sometimes you'll actually see things that they talk about that aren't even on the roadmap sites. They'll make little announcements in there. Um, so for example, there was a couple, mo a couple months ago I was asking about adding external users to groups. And they said, yep, that's on a roadmap. That hasn't actually appeared anywhere specifically, but they've, but they've said it on the public. They, they said it publicly yesterday. Yeah, yeah, here they have now, right. Yeah. All right, so, so yeah, we see the mic. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I like this approach about asking some of the questions um, about who's on-premise, who's not. Um, I think uh, what a lot of people seem to fail to, uh, at least hopefully I'm wrong on this one, but uh, the SharePoint ecosystem is very diverse. It's very big. Does Microsoft really know what's out there? Because the reality is, does anybody realize that you also bundle SharePoint heavily with your Dynamics products, and those tend to be pigeon-toed for us when we, for example, running AX, we're pigeon-toed in an on-premise solution, but we're one version behind. Where's Microsoft taking those stacks? Or do, they, do they listen to those customers, especially those who are pigeon-toed on the CRM or the GP? And then they're kicking out all these things going, oh, you can do this, you can do that. Do, do they ever take into consideration that one of your biggest chunks of money actually comes from your ERP division sometimes? And a lot of the times people drive their business needs through enterprise portal, which tends to be to extend the business outside the normal confines of an office. Can I take my business on the road? Oh, you SharePoint, because it ties into AX. Well, yeah. 2010. I think that they do look at it and they do see it. We kind of laugh. We were at MVP Summit um, earlier this year and we started the drinking game whenever someone said the word telemetry. So they are totally looking and trying to get their arms around what everyone is doing. There's certain cases where it's a lot easier to do. So in Office 365 now, you start to see them making decisions based around telemetry. When you look at 2016, there's going to be some ways for them to get the telemetry in the on-prem environments so that they can get those, those data points and look at it. So I think it's one of those things that they're trying to listen and they're trying to do, but it's really a, a two-way street as well but to be engaged to. and get to the right people. But again, who are they listening to? Because you keep saying stuff about listening to the customers. I'm a customer. Nobody's listening to me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they will now. Believe me, you're on recording. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Sean. And, 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 and it's Sean a fair Sean, comment. I um, and I, I obviously I'm on your side on this. I think um, uh, to, to, to your point specifically, Microsoft culturally is, uh, they did some what I would call strange things as far as engineering decisions for the past you know, decade. Uh, part of it was that they were super siloed, they were super competitive. There has been so much breaking down of walls institutionally in Microsoft, it, we're all seeing big changes related to that that will help address your kind of problem. The second is Microsoft is also very intentionally decoupling technologies. 
um, so that they can innovate more rapidly on each platform. That's why, for example, SharePoint 2016 is no longer uh, being locked to the release of Exchange 2016 so that they can deliver two quality products that both are able to innovate on each other and leverage these services infrastructures. So as they, as they change those architectures, I think you'll, you'll see some improvements there. Uh, the, the one other point I'll make is keep in mind that just because you're locked to SharePoint for uh, version N minus one or N minus two for Dynamics, that doesn't mean your collaboration environment has to be on that. You can and should have farms and technologies and platforms and products that support your workloads most uh, appropriately. And in the case of on-prem SharePoint, there's lots and lots and lots of good reasons for having multiple farms. And a lot of the pain points for those are we can start seeing roadmaps to solving those with the cloud SSAs and things like and Delve and things like that now. You know, in many ways, this event is part of that approach at Microsoft. You know, historically, you know, how many of you, I'd be curious, show of hands, how many of you are longtime SharePoint conference veterans? Okay, great. Tech Ed? Anyone from Mech? A couple. Hey, this event is trying to admit that, you know, we're in a, what you saw, I think, in the keynote is it's not just a Word, PowerPoint, Excel world. Um, you've got tools like Sway and Delve and other ways of composing things. It's about cross-pollinating across information stacks. In many cases, if you can you know, look at the Convergence event. It's about experiences, Chris. It's about experiences. <laughs> um, you know, Convergence historically has been a Dynamics-only event. And as you, you know, we expect to see Convergence moving forward to be much more business value and make sure that additional technologies are being covered in that event as well. So it's a different world, and you know, Microsoft needs to be given a little time to let that all sink in, but I think it'll look very different next year. So I'm gonna take a question from this Twitter stream also. Well, actually, let me take one from the Twitter stream here. Um, uh, do you think SharePoint on-prem, since there's a majority of people who are on-prem, can stay current with the Agile model in Office 365? Let's start with that one. I, it, I think it depends on how you define current, because the answer's no. Office 365 is gonna be, a, you know, evolving every day. I uh, got on a plane last week to go speak at a conference. I got on the plane and my husband looked at me and said, hey, your session's out of date because they just completely revved the video portal. And that all just happened overnight. So I mean, it's constantly changing and it's good, um, but it's not gonna come to on-prem. They're not gonna release a patch to on-prem every time they do something to Office 365. So it, if you're saying, is it gonna remain current? Like it's gonna remain in sync? with Office 365, I think they've been pretty clear in saying n no. But they are improving the patching process, so yeah, maybe yeah. that will help, yeah. so. Yeah, and to the point, there was a, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll keep this question going for a second, but to that point specifically, there was a question from downstairs about zero downtime patching, and is it possible? The answer is not in the current version, but they've made it very clear it is possible in, in the next version. Um, and on this, on this currency thing, I think we, we see a trend across the Microsoft stack. You saw this in the keynote, you saw it in Julia White's and, and Seth Patton's sessions of delivering products as a service now. So we're seeing it with Windows, we're seeing it with Microsoft Office. And if you didn't see that slide, basically what it revealed was that they are decoupling feature updates with security updates. So that security updates can come on a regular um, basis and keep your systems patched and secure. Feature updates will come at a slightly different cadence and can be deferred for a period of time. So we're seeing that across many, 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 many pieces of the Microsoft environment. They haven't said anything about how that impacts SharePoint. But if you think again that Microsoft is trying to start doing things as a single company, that approach that they're taking in Windows and Office has got to inform them. Has got to, they've got to be thinking about that and thinking what can we do to help on-prem customers stay current with their, on their choice, right? Um, so that you know, they've got to be thinking about that, and I'm sure that I'm sure we will not be in a situation in 2018 where we are still, you know, three years behind from the cloud. I'm, I can't imagine that's going to be the case. Yep. All right, yeah. in, in the Actually, I, I'm going to stand up because we've been here for 45 minutes, and feel free to do that. And I want to make sure because I'm on this side of the room, stage left side of the room. So I, there's a gentleman over here. We haven't gotten nearly as many questions in this side of the room, so I just wanted to. Good. Uh, hello. Uh, my, I'm curious on your thoughts on branding, uh, especially in a hybrid environment where we're trying to keep online and uh, the on-prem and the collaboration environment, how branding, what are the challenges and we should be prepared for? You sh you're not supposed to do branding. <laughs> uh, yeah. Next question. 
I think if you're going to do custom branding at this point, you have to, uh, Dan said it well, it's knowing the risk, right? So you have to know that if you're going to be doing custom branding and you're choosing to do it inside of Office 365 and on-prem, when Office 365 features roll and update, you have to make sure that your branding is still going to work and it becomes a different scenario. So if you have the resources in house and you want to make that investment, it's still there and it's supported, but it's probably going to be rocky and bumpy. So if you don't have those resources in house and you don't want to make that investment, you know, maybe we can get away from the branding. There's and, a little company profile button in there now that lets you change the colors and the logo. Yeah, I mean, there's some little <laughs> things, but that, you know, yeah. doesn't so, really count as branding. I think this days. ties back to the last the last comment about, you know, about staying on-prem, though. That, look, there's, you make a business decision, not a technology decision around that. And it may be the right business decision. You, you Yes, we want to be, it's not about the, the security patches, the updates, things from that, but from a feature perspective for those on-prem, there's a business reason that some of our customers are remaining on-prem. One of them is a highly customized, branded experience for specific workloads, specific customer and employee experiences inside of SharePoint. They're not looking to have the latest, greatest, you know, every week on that. They're building something that they expect to live for a certain amount of time and have a certain amount of update as part of that, that cadence internally, which is why these customers have decided, one of the reasons, to stay on-prem. So so you make that decision based on what your business needs, and if it's that highly customized, branded experience as part of that, that may drive some of the decisions you then make about, about that. But the other reality is you then need, part of that risk mitigation is understanding now when changes do come out, you then need to manage that and update and test those new pieces. Yeah, and you know we can't have it all, right? Um, what we have to do as IT people is help our as, is communicate exactly these points to the constituents in our business that are asking us to do things that are potentially risky or simply unrealistic. We as IT have been over the past couple of years as a business sort of shrinking back under burdens of you know reduced budgets and and technology crunches. We've got to stand up to the business and say, look, yes, you can you can have a customized branded environment, but here's the risk. The risk is there's going to be a highly valuable workload that we could deliver a different way that the branding interferes with. Um, did you have something else to say? Or do you want to get the no? I want to. There's uh, there's someone in the back. I know. It's yeah, yeah. Mic. Let's get you in the very, yes. very, very back. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, no, very back. Thank you for your patience. He's had the mic since the beginning and hasn't been able to answer. So go ahead. And, and the stand mic's up. not working. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to laugh. Battery ran out in the power. Didn't mean to. Okay. I'm in one. I work for one of those organizations, highly customized, latest and greatest. We're going to be on prem for a while. Quick question: How would I be able to identify the? Uh, resources or the technology that the cloud could possibly provide for my organization in 2018? Oh, I will answer that question on behalf of Microsoft's executives who told me exactly what the answer is. You can't. <laughs> Honest to God, uh, when, when I was creating a keynote last year, I was talking to one of the Microsoft execs. I said, what message would you like be as CEOs and directors to hear? And he said, you cannot do long-term tech planning. This is, this is what you want me to say to my board. Well, no. And I mean, so here's the deal. You can't. And the reason is, Microsoft says, we can't. They are at the core of technology, and they cannot anticipate five years down the road what things are going to look like. And they said, if we can't, our customers can't. That's just the reality. Now, that doesn't mean your boss is going to ask you to do it. But, the, but and, and again, it becomes a cost versus risk decision. You can make all kinds of decisions today. But the risk is you're going to be completely wrong. And the likelihood of that risk is very high. I think about all the factors involved. It's not just what's happening at Microsoft and their products. There are other factors in just technology and, and what's going on with competitors and things that all would play into that. Even with the hardware, I mean, IT for the longest time, I mean, the longest that you see a realistic plan, and which is all, always painful, is like a three-year cycle. You're looking at the cost of the hardware investments alone spread out across three years. Think of that. Has anybody been in an organization where the, the laptop or your desktop computer is a three-year cycle for renewal? And how great is that? You know, where you've worn it out in 18 months and it's like double the capacity. And it, like, I'm, I was complaining buying my son this beautiful little Dell that was half the cost of my Surface Pro 3 and twice as powerful, you know, that just, like, just came out. I did a Dell plug there for your former employer there. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. But yes. it, it's you know, it, it does change so rapidly, and that's just the hardware. That's just that that even from a consumer basis. Now to go and think about your business systems, you cannot plan your business around a static workload experience. It's our businesses are changing, the technology is changing, the hardware is changing, and so you have to be a re realistic about how you can plan for that stuff. So, I, Thank you. I, I, just to speak to a little of the complexity, let's look a little bit more broadly. You know, if we look at the evolution of enterprise technology through BYOD and into an Internet of Things environment, what does IoT really mean for the enterprise landscape in four or five years? In theory, you know, we will have billions of devices pumping telemetry in. Is there an Office 365 experience of those? Possibly. Will all devices there be created equal? Probably not. It's very hard to anticipate with any specificity. You know, I may care far more about, you know, doors and premises monitors as people are moving on and off premises, or it could be about... Um, Chips in our palms. Right. Right. You know, the Internet of Useless Things. <laughs> yeah. um, but there are so many meta trends that are going on right now um, about all that Microsoft can do is we've been, and, and Microsoft is not alone in this. If you talk to an Oracle or an Apple or a Google or anyone else, is to be as open to the customer dialogue as possible and be responsive. To do that, you need to speak up. And, you know, again, user voice and forums, I actively encourage everyone to weight those things appropriately. And I think to one, one last point to the long-term plan, there's a couple of things that I recommend to customers about long-term planning. The first is commit to the Microsoft stack. I, I truly believe, and I wouldn't have said this two years ago to be completely honest, but I truly believe today Microsoft is poised to really own the enterprise stack in the cloud. They have done really good things, and there is nobody that's going to be able to catch up with them in the three-year time frame that you're talking about. It's not going to happen. Um, so they are going to be there as, as well as anyone can be for the, for, the, for the future. So commit to that. Figure out what it's going to take to be hybrid. Start thinking about that now even if you're going to stay on-prem. Be ready. Um, and then the other thing is the real, the real three to five year plan should be how do we transform our IT organization from being about supporting de devices and plumbing and platforms to interfacing with the business, identifying problems, building solutions, regardless of whether those solutions are hosted in our private cloud or in a public cloud or something we've built. It's a, it's a focus on instead of being uh, so buried in the infrastructure, it's about focusing on the innovation that's being created and the business value that's being driven. Yeah. And it's not just just a platitude, and it is changing a focus fundamentally how we look at these systems. Uh, uh, folks, if you're, if you're looking for seats, I just want to point out, two just opened up here in the front. The downside is you're sitting next to our good friend Adam. Adam, so. yeah, sorry. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask you guys about security. I'm hearing analysts starting to say that it makes more sense to put your most secure stuff in the cloud because Microsoft has more technical people, more resources, red teams shredded document security, Azure, all that sort of stuff than it does to have it on-prem because you can't have the same quality of staff or detection on-prem. What do you think? So I'm a CTO for a cybersecurity company and I couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. It is definitely true that the Microsofts, the Googles, it's, uh, the Amazons of the world represent a higher profile attack surface. But I was talking to a CISO at a Fortune um, 50 company last year about Fort Knox. And if you're familiar with what Fort Knox is, it's a back-end encryption technology where the individual pieces of files are separately encrypted and distributed. Um, and he was talking about how he thought his team could do it. And the truth of the matter is he can't. No one can. If you have you know, a large information security practice internally, you may be able to approximate the level of attention that's paid to edge devices, connectivity, and patching approximate it. But the truth of the matter is the deepest pockets, you know, Microsoft spends more in R&D than any other tech company in the world. The deepest pockets in fundamental research and deploying the technology, make sure, you know, assuring that is there going to be a breach eventually somewhere? Yes. But the mean time between breach from a major provider like Microsoft is going to be massively less than what you get if you roll your own. We all know that security by obscurity is no protection. And the fact that your local data center living in your, your office may be obscure does not mean that it's secure. Yeah, ask Sony about that. Yeah, and if you, yeah. And if you look at where the majority of those attacks come from, it's not coming from these types of, of cloud services. It's coming from the local. It's, it's, yeah, so there's, you know, Microsoft has done, I shared a stat in the last session talking about uh, uh, the, basically giving Microsoft props for uh, 
doing a great job of improving on the messaging around security, going after every certification that's out there, that telling that story again and again and again. So the number of organizations that Gartner shared back in the early 2013, um, everybody's heard this stat. They said in 2013, in five to seven years, 35% of organizations were saying we will never move to the cloud. 15% were saying we're going to be pure cloud in five to seven years, and uh, the remainder 50% were saying we're going to be in hybrid. Uh, what's amazing is a year later, so last year I was talking with Julia White at the WPC, and she said the percentage of companies saying we'll never move to the cloud in that one year had dropped to about 20%. So Microsoft, and it's, Microsoft has been doing that active campaign and doing a great job. So you have to ask yourself, if you are in a regulated industry where you have specific certifications where you are required to have, and if Microsoft now is checking off the tick marks and has those certifications, you then have to ask yourself, what's holding you back from moving to the cloud? Yeah, and the resource to stay the most connected to that is the Office 365 Trust Center. So that's the, the resource that is going to give you all of the information about what they're doing, what certifications they have, how they're monitoring and maintaining all of that. So if you're not familiar with that, that's a, an excellent site to go look at. Awesome. And I think we are actually running out of time. So let's, uh, let's do a couple of quick things here. Let's point you to some... Oh, we got 15 minutes? We are not anywhere near out of time. <laughs> you guys are fooled. Um, let me, let's, uh, yeah, let's take one from uh, in the room. Uh, let's go on this side of the room again. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead, we'll repeat the question. <laughs> All right, I'll repeat the question as best I can. Is it still required to run PS config after update, wait 200 years and cry when it fails? I think we can relate to that. I'll, I'll take a, a couple of little notes on that. First, let me talk about the current state. Um, with applying updates, there are, um, uh, there are some scripts online, and I can point you to them, that will make imp installing updates in the current version much more streamlined. And it's all about shutting down certain services before you apply the update. So I, I had this issue in Sochi, and we got our updates down to a couple of minutes. So it's doable now. Um, however, as far as moving forward with next version, does anyone talk about that? I don't know if we know the details. I want to look up, I'm going to look up that... Okay, uh, we'll look up the details. The, 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 the update infrastructure, though, is now a zero downtime online in install. So whatever it is, it's designed to reduce, to eliminate that pain. And again, the reason is because Microsoft had to eliminate the pain in the cloud for themselves, and so they're now baking exactly what they do in Office 365 into our environment. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. So now that Microsoft is pushing uh, to cloud, and of course uh, we hear you, and I think you are also saying that uh, you should, we should start thinking about the cloud. What is the Microsoft strategy around migrating on-premises data to uh, to cloud? And I I have a session means we had a session like, but demo didn't work, so <laughs> I'm a little confused. Like, how much Microsoft is investing? What are the tools we have, and something like that. I uh, just want to get to the last question first. Um, the, the answer on TechNet, Russ Maxwell has a blog post that he put out about a year and a half ago specifically detailing the services to shut off at the start of a patch cycle and then resume at the end if you want the patch cycle to run more quickly. Russ Maxwell on TechNet. All right. Um, so the migration story was the question. Um, so the migration story is changing quickly. Um, they just released a set of APIs, um, or they just publicly released a set of APIs that uh, enhance the speed of migration significantly. Uh, so that's going to help a lot. Um, also, we've seen them make some change in Azure uh, that support drive shipping as a migration form. So again, I've, I've, I've heard nothing specific about that in the SharePoint space, but it's a little hard to third imagine. Third-party tools. Like that. And third-party tools. So I, what I can say is across the board, I mean, the third-party tool providers were working together providing feedback back to Microsoft. So it's been all of the major vendors have been working closely with Microsoft on getting to this point. Yeah, and we had a question from downstairs that was related, which is what about getting data from Office 365 back to on-prem? Migration tools, third-party third tools, tools. Do that too. Yeah. third party, third party, third party tools. tools, and no, to answer the question specifically, no, there's no really fast way to do it. Not surprisingly, Microsoft is focused first on providing faster ways of getting into the cloud than getting out of it. <laughs> the good news is that they are investing in getting us uh, better speeds. Um, all right, let's uh, actually we're doing too much in the front. Let's uh, let's see if we can get one on the side here. Is there a mic over here? Mic in the back, straight right. in the back. The straight in the back is someone who has a mic. Okay, yep. go ahead. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hey, um, 
I just got done training my users on the whole tagging the documents and stuff, <laughs> right? And explaining the benefits of tagging, and Microsoft goes on to release OneDrive for Business, which doesn't support tagging. So what was the justification in releasing that feature so quickly when they didn't have any um, path between moving your documents from OneDrive for Business to uh, your SharePoint document libraries? So, uh, I, Doing I the training was fun, bit, though, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, see what Dan said about an hour ago, about want to match the workload with the specific requirements that you have there. Enterprise content management is usually best thought of, and I'm doing a session tomorrow where we'll talk about this more, um, for well-orchestrated, well-considered, well-regulated processes where I have precise terms that I want to use to classify things to be able to apply things like information lifecycle policy to them. OneDrive for Business is not intended for that. OneDrive for Business is intended to be a place for rapid collaboration, ideation, sharing of documents, um, but it's tied to the person and not to the enterprise. And so that's the best I can say is the justification for keeping all of that tagging features, they're tied to team sites. You know, one of the things that Microsoft is kind of, as we mentioned earlier, Microsoft is doubling down on the things that they know people are using. The team site is a fantastic repository for customized, as a container for enterprise content, for collaboration, augmented with tools like app parts and web parts and the ECM pieces. And so it's about, I would say, really look to match the specific requirement to the workload. I, it's just an example of that. Like I'll go and work with uh, an individual or a customer and do some back and forth of something that's an idea, sharing some initial documents, uh, a contract. But once it is a formal project, we have a template, a site template for a formal project that goes in the structure where there's workflow, there's certain activities, there's notifications and alerts that go out to the rest of the team around that. So it, for us, we have that ad hoc collaboration that gives us as an individual to collaborate as we need. And then once it is in a, an official approved project, it's in our structured, more structured collaboration environment. Yeah, and, um, and uh, first of all, as far as tags and taxonomy goes, be, be given confidence that Microsoft is very much aware that information architecture and taxonomy uh, is, is a need for customers in the cloud. Um, and this addresses one other question that I'll just sort of repeat here, which is about governance of these new workloads. Uh, and I'd like to get some thoughts on this as well, but I'll start. And that is that Microsoft has very publicly said, we're gonna focus on delivering features first and information control second. Because in the past, they often would create an information control for a setting that no one then ever used. Um, and so they're shifting their focus to making sure that they have a feature that is, is providing value to customers, getting that telemetry. Um, and then building in the information controls. They are definitely aware that information architecture and taxonomy needs to be enhanced in OneDrive um, and across all of these new workloads. And that kind of speaks to how they do Office 365 feature rollouts right now. So MVP and the minimal viable product is what they come out with. And that means if you're like, let's say using a high-end video portal system and they come out with the Office 365 video portal, that's an MVP. It's probably not going to fit your needs on day one. It might fit your needs six months later. It might fit your needs a year later. But what we've seen, and, and it's not maybe necessarily something that they've said, but what we've seen on every one of the major things that they've released this year in MVP, so Delve, Groups, Video Portal, features are coming first and all of the controls are coming later. But what we've also seen is they release something and they immediately get a slew of feedback that says, are you crazy? I cannot use this until you give me X. And then we get X in one of the next releases. So instead of them trying to define what X is before the features come out, it's just a new way of rolling things out, which is also why we need to be diligent and getting in there and giving them our feedback when that happens. And so I, I agree completely. I kind of chuckled when you ask about the tagging and the taxonomy because it's been very painful for me over the last year as these things come out. So I totally feel I totally feel your pain and agree with the advice that everybody's given up here. We just kind of have to work through it. I was just going to say that uh, going back to the partner ecosystem there are for that specific issue, there are also office-based uh, uh, auto-tagging uh, third-party tools that are out there, some wonderful solutions that are really interesting, so that you could do that to help automate a lot of that activity, so. You can turn on the enterprise keywords 
setting in a OneDrive, but it's not something that would be automatically there. Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> it's, again, that's not really the purpose of those. Yeah, and, and Keep to, what's good. And to Jennifer, Jennifer's point, one of the things that we as customers of Microsoft can do is become better partners with Microsoft in that if you, the more you understand that what they're release, releasing are these minimum viable products and they're there to sort of throw something up against the wall and see if people use it and get feedback, what our role needs to become is trying those features, giving them constructive feedback and not just saying, oh, this is crap, we're never going to use this. That kind of noise doesn't help. Help Microsoft understand if it's a feature that you simply, no matter how good this feature is, I'm never going to use it. That's, that's good feedback. But otherwise, here's what I really need to make it work because they do listen. There was Delve and Boards. We all saw it in November at the MVP Summit. And we were like, oh, we need, or I was at Delve, I should say. And we were all like, we need X. And that X is now in the product. So they do listen and, and they innovate I'd say quickly. that the best feedback you can give them isn't always around the features, but it's to go and say, here is the oh, business scenario, scenario yep. that I'm trying to solve. Absolutely. I can't solve it with this tool here's the business scenario. Very good point. That That's how the engineers very listen. very well to them when you're giving that feedback. And they are thinking about that. That's why I, I, mean, I joke about the experiences across that. But they are now looking at those things end to end. And there may be focus on you say, well, that's a less important feature, but it is necessary for the overall experience across the, the various features. Like look at groups, groups and team sites. They've kind of been two separate things. And now they realize as a, as a workload, as a business user using these things, you need to have them together and under, the groups and team sites understanding each other and being connected. We're we're inside we're inside of five minutes, so we need to approach sort of a lightning round here. Yeah. So I, and then the lightning round, I'd like to. Uh, I've got one from the Twitter stream, so I'm sorry. And oh, let me let me first say there's a couple of places you can go to hear more of these conversations. Um, and why don't we each really quickly point because I know there's and and to participate in more of these questions. Christian, you've got your. Yeah, so one of the things that I host a, myself uh, uh, and uh, Naomi Moneypenny and, and uh, Benjamin Nyland and Mark Anderson have a monthly show called Collab Talk on IT Unity where we go through and talk about, and yes, I poke fun at Ben and Mark the most, um, but it's a lot of fun where we dig into the details of the latest things that are coming out in SharePoint and Office 365 and really the Office suite, and we talk about them from a business context um, and, and kind of break them up part and, and uh, share experiences. Uh, it's a lot of fun and very valuable. And you've got your tweet jams too. And I do the monthly tweet jams as well. So on Twitter, hashtag collab talk. And I'll be doing one later this month on various topics that are just kind of the topics of the month driving, you know, the conversation. Um, my blog is wonderlar.com and I do the weekly SharePoint Power Hour show, which is things that you can do out of the box with Office 365 and SharePoint. It's at youtube.com slash SharePoint RAX. And um, also, Lori Gowan and I are presenting tomorrow morning, driving user adoption from a technical standpoint. It's for IT pros. It's things that you can do, central admin, active directory, group policy, to be able to help the end user have their experience be easier and them hate SharePoint less. Cool. Uh, my blog is jenniferannmason.com. I post a lot for the end user and business perspective. I also host a weekly show on IT Unity called Office 365 Pulse. Um, it's an hour long show and in the first 30 minutes we do a summary digest of everything that has rolled to Office 365. A lot of times we point to where you go to the user voice, where you go to Yammer to do it. And then in the second half we usually pick one of the newest features and actually do a little bit of a deep dive into it. So our next show is next week. We do it weekly and it's a lot of fun. Um, so I also have a blog at chrismcnulty.net. But I'm not nearly as creative or energized as my colleagues here. So mostly what I do is I just barge in on their properties whenever I have a few minutes. Yeah, and uh, we, I, um, at ITunity, I help run Tech Talk with Bill Baer. Uh, and uh, I'd like to point out next week's show, particularly a week from Friday, uh, we are going to do a mega Ask Bill Anything, a one hour of just pounding Bill with questions. Because now he, can, now he can actually that. answer them all, which he hasn't been able to so far. Um, so come to that. Um, now, the lightning round question is with... Uh, customers who have hundreds of use cases, terabytes of data, what are the most successful workloads that, uh, to move to the cloud, and which ones really should stay on-prem? Anyone want to start with that, Chris? Uh, I would absolutely say OneDrive for business, because if you're looking at preventing information bleed, people are putting things into personal clouds, whether it's dro unmanaged Dropbox or unmanaged Box or other places, and just being able to provide an enterprise way to get that BYOD experience is a strong way of doing it, and sync is going to get better. Promise that. Yes. Um, 
I like to look at groups right now. So I think of all the teams that I work on that I have a need to share a calendar, share a few quick documents, and have a few quick conversations, but I don't want to have to go to someplace else. I think groups is an excellent way um, to get in there and start using and taking advantage of some of the features. And anything that should definitely stay on-prem? I thought you said go to the cloud. Both, both extremes. Oh, well, groups is only online, so okay. there. And that should go online. Um, on-prem, I don't know. I'm, I, I think branding and custom code and BI is really what keeps you on-prem right now. Security used to be in that bucket for me, but it's, I mean, they've come so far that unless you're doing really something custom, I'd say start looking at SharePoint Online. Yep, and I mentioned the intranet homepage example of putting in the cloud or in both places. Another one, I agree with these guys, another one I think now that we need to start looking at is search. Uh, primarily because it's going to allow us to not only support hybrid SharePoint and Office 365, but also multiple farms, multiple tenancies. Basically, by having Office 365 search, we can put everything in one place and then search for it. As far as the on-prem goes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll steal and say two things. One is high-impact business workloads. Even Microsoft keeps those on-prem. Um, and it's not because of security. It's because of SLAs. It, my, my Office 365 is only a 3.9 SLA. If you need something more than that, you, or if you need tagging or taxonomy, those kinds of things for those workloads stay on-prem. The other thing specifically to answer a question from downstairs is um, full trust code. Full trust code stays on-prem, and yes, it will be supported in SharePoint 2016 and probably moving forward because Microsoft doesn't, need, doesn't see any need to cut that off at the knees. Uh, I think uh, for the cloud, uh, I, like he said, OneDrive for business and uh, maybe user profiles and search. Mm -hmm. But then on premises, like the custom business processes, SSRS, like we've talked about, things like that that um, that are very that are very custom built in your organization. So again, I use OneDrive you know, extensively for that, uh, for a little more st structured and organized, um, you know, Office 365. I'd actually say something that I use extensively because of through community activities. Uh, is Yammer? I was just going to say brought Yammer. Up Nobody's Yammer. brought up like, Yammer. Um, but uh, you know, for and for somebody who is so, I know that people have strong feelings around that either, either way. But I use it extensively for community, for partner and customer activities and small communities. It's it's like the fastest, best, simple uh, extranet solution out there. Uh, but for on-prem, the same thing. We have a lot of customers that have very specialized, uh, you know, custom solutions that they developed, and uh, we're just trying to ensure, you know, to help them to understand. Uh, that's core to your business. It does not have to move. All right. And uh, we have a few shirts to give away. I'm actually going to take a few names off of Twitter here uh, who, from people keeping the rest of the community informed. Galen, uh, Laura, uh, Lori Witzel, um, Beth Beck, and David Van Sickle. If you guys come up, we got some shirts for you. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks See a you lot. my session this afternoon, Thanks, I hope. Thank you.